Hi, Foss Asia 2020. It's great to be here, albeit remote. Um, so I hope you're all well. I hope everybody's keeping well. We'd like to start this talk by taking a picture. Um, if you don't want to be in this picture, then please hide your face, hold from something in front of your face. Okay, thank you very much. Foss Age 2025, it's great to be back. Proud to see everybody here. Um, again, as we've done in past talks, we'd like to take a picture. Um, if you don't want yourself in this picture, then please hold something in front of your face. Um, okay, let's go. Thank you very much. So, what a year it's been. So we've had the 28th Amendment in uh, America, the Trump Amendment. He's in office until the party gets sufficient votes to overtake. That will trigger an election. But this has to be a physical nationwide poll that overtakes sentiment analysis across all social media and news outlets and whatever the government wants to do. It has to overtake the AI before an election is triggered. Otherwise, he's still the president. COVID-25, um, predicted by AI and tracked through wearable tech, was stopped in its tracks after only a thousand cases and no deaths. Singapore continues to act as a bridge between areas. Um, it's acting as a, an area where you can get access to the balkanized web, so you can get logons to the Chinese web, the Russian web, the EU web, the American web. Um, and one of the interesting things about the uh, American web is that it's got very aggressive AI and it's e-commerce. You log on with bank details and AI predicts what, what it is you want, and what it is uh, you need, sends it to you and deducts payments before you do anything. Um, and you then got to start to fight to get refunds through online AI courts. We've had drone swarms um, at exits of transport hubs um, using facial recognition technology. Um, these are tracking people with temperatures or other known suspects, etc. cetera. Um, I'm not sure what term they use, but uh, it's starting to track people um, across lots of towns. Quite interesting seeing the swarms fly around there. So who are we? We are DataKind, a global nonprofit that uh, harnesses the power of data science and AI in the service of humanity is a, is a strap line. Um, they do pro bono data work through meetups um, and all sorts of other events that they organize for charities and nonprofits. It starts to get the charities and nonprofits interested in being data driven um, and it starts to introduce people who are data scientists and interested in data and data driven things in, uh, introduced to the NGOs and, and, the, and the charities. There are uh, six chapters around the world, two in America, one in the UK, uh, one in uh, India and one here in, in Singapore. So the results from the uh, pictures that we've been taking, so we've been analysing the data through uh, clean de-biased data um, and we've been looking at the audience through uh, and all sorts of other things, through social media and various other things that, that we can get uh, data allowed to have the data of. Um, and we are, as a, as a slide says, we've been using de-biased holomorphic encryption. It's securely stored, it's all auditable, and only a few people have access to the unencrypted data. This goal was to maximize ticket sales, so maximize the revenue, that um, FOSS Asia got. And so we can then plow that back into the community, uh, giving away free tickets, early bird tickets, bursaries and, and prizes. The uh, models were developed and were assessed by a panel against the, the uh, Singapore framework for AI um, and the data sharing agreement. Um, we're gonna present some, uh, a, a chart on that because we've been having some issues with that. Um, and now we've got a change things, especially now as the Singapore AI framework is regulation. Um, we've got to have a look at maybe re-engineering engineering some, some of those things. So here's some results. Um, divided the community up into these groups, into five groups. 
we normalized the attendance to the 2019 um, attendance and we've been tracking that. We've had, had to go back through the data and track all that. And what we've been seeing is that some groups have been um, impacted and others have gone up in, in the numbers. And now we've got to go through all this data and say, see why that was happening. We may be discovering proxies. Um, and now the AI framework is regulation. We need to start to fix this and re-engineer some of, some of the work that's been done. Um, had we been looking for proxies earlier, then maybe we could have avoided some of this bias and had fairer access. Um, but we can't go back and correct it now. But what we can do is review the strategy going forward. So back to FOS Asia 2020. So, mm -hmm. I'd like to take a picture, but maybe we shouldn't because we don't know what kind of things we're going to start to introduce into this. So let's do a, a bit of a, a revisit. Early in 2019, the PDPA published a framework and they invited comments. Um, looking at this, uh, especially the contributors, we thought that there wasn't enough evolve, involvement or protection of civil society. So data kind, people from effective altruism and interested individuals got together um, and wrote a response paragraph by paragraph suggesting improvement. It didn't take away the substance of the framework, but we thought it added dimensions of work towards protections, awareness and for uh, and protections and awareness. And for the PDPA, these improvements could potentially stop litigation. This was in the form of, uh, we called ourselves a, a uh, what did we call ourselves, a working group, um, non-profit working group for AI. Um, some of the stuff got into the version two of the paper and uh, we were credited with that. But before we get to AI and responsible AI, um, I think a lot of this starts with, with data and this is just the latest graphic that, in, that indicates in some of the major areas how much data is, uh, is, is going to uh, uh, going away from from all our interactions because we've moved increasingly from the physical to the digital and we're generating vast amounts of data with every action that we take it pours onto servers with greater volume and at greater speeds than ever before and we give up this data mostly for free it is this data resource or a fire hose whatever you want to call it that feeds the machines that generate revenue um, with new ever more accurate recommendation engines in and of itself, this may not be really a problem, more of an irritation with constant interruptions of pop-up adverts. And to some, it seems slightly creepy when um, you're on another computer and it seems to know what you're looking at on a different computer. But everything is data these days. Uh, to my mind, one of the emerging battlegrounds is voice. The more we speak to things, the more we record, the more data we are giving up to make more accurate engines. Um, but that's a good thing, isn't it? We want the models to become more, more accurate. Isn't it even more irritating when we're recommended hair products when we're bald? Um, and various mistakes like that. But it seems to me that we live in this age of constant cognitive dissonance. We know we're giving away data, and that may be a bad idea. It's invasive, but there's so much cool stuff out there and so much of it for free. But it is how this data is taken, how we convince to do it, and what is done with that data that, is, that can be part of the problem. Shoshana Zuboff, in her book, Surveillance Capitalism, talks about data being expropriated since there is no late, uh, apparent law against it in many cases. Data is taken without permission, worked into product, and sold back to us. They seem to work on uh, the, the they. They seem to work on the idea that it's better to ask forgiveness for permission. Um, and so if you look at products like Street View, that was developed in this way. Google drove around, took lots of pictures, since public spaces are free. And it's been brilliant. It's been a, a boom to many people. But we are being habituated into giving away a lot and then paying to get it back. And if we object to this, it feels like a losing battle. Things like the right to be forgotten, to have potentially damaging data removed, is being rolled back across the world. And this can cause problems. The case of Nada Sultani in Iran shows what can happen when mistakes are made. The name was similar to one associated with a shooting during the election in 2009. A link was made after searching for a similar name um, and her, her face 
uh, Naya's face was then posted as the face of a martyr. The authorities approached her, um, asking her to debunk the killing as fake news she was to appear in person. Uh, she wouldn't do that, and what she was then told that she could be charged with treason, threatened with imprisonment, even death, um, and eventually she became a refugee. Um, and many people think this is just the beginning. A lot of this will get worse and worse as IoT and wearables become more ubiquitous, um, gathering data about how we react to things, and mistakes will be made. You could say that this has been done for a long time, but, mod but, but uh, these days with the models used in AI systems, they are getting better at doing it at scale and at speed. Um, and presumably that will go for the mistakes, some of the mistakes as well. Things like the five factor personality model has been used to get against what we post on social media for quite a while. It isn't always what we post, but how we post, the language used, length of words and other parameters. And this is met with some success in predicting which demographic people are in. Now imagine that when so much more emotion is, is transmitted with our voice, our manner, our deportment in a, in a video stream, tie that up with directly measurable parameters from wearables, and we are setting ourselves up to be manipulated big time. Um, that's a, but then you have a look at things and how much more information is gathered from watching someone react to a video clip with micro emotions, surprise, anger, confusion, sympathy. As opposed to this event survey that simply says, I liked it. Couple that with heartbeat, blood pressure, breathing rate, arousal, anxiety states. And you have something that says, I can be manipulated far more successfully by, by applying micro stimuli, stimuli in images, text and sound to herd and to nudge. Um, with a longer term goal in mind, and we're not always sure what those goals are. Maybe it's not an issue when something pops up that's really cool, uh, that we didn't know we wanted, but when democracy is at stake, and money buys more airtime and social media time than the next guy, then inequalities in the world are amplified. It might be okay if we're nudged towards a healthier lifestyle, we like bad sugary food and drink, um, so our health can be nudged towards better things. But if I'm sold, remedies to cure my bad behavior or insurance premiums go up, then we can create socio-economic inequalities. And there are people who can't afford to get better and might be trapped in a policy that determines the food they get. And that can trap people further as poor diet can lead to poor academic achievement and no way to get out of, out of this trap. And on social media, experiments have been done on millions of people and published in academic journals that now show marked shift in voting behavior with A-B type testing in social media streams. And these experiments do not have to follow the same ethical standards that academia does. In the US, I believe it's the common rule introduced after many manipulative experiments in the 1960s. But academics are now knocking on the doors of some companies to do this kind of research. Do they live with a cognitive dissonance and pretend they're doing good? Or are they unethical researchers? Next question these kind of things. And with respect to our privacy, um, giving our data away could be a violation of privacy, what it feel, what, but what does it feel like to have privacy violated? There's research that talks about um, that we behave as if our personal physical space is being violated. And how do we deal with this? There are cultural norms physically that we can learn and we can start to adhere to and respect in different cultural areas. And we, we need to do that online as well somehow. But to help with part of that, we need control of our data, who has it, who takes it, and what they do with it. In the voice battleground, companies have been taken to task about snooping on our daily interactions, televisions, digital assistants, toys even. Um, and some of this data is being transcribed by humans, so people are reading this. Um, and for those who say, they, well, you've got nothing to hide, do you really want your private conversations listened to, transcribed, and potentially sold on? How do you react if somebody's following you around all day and making notes on everything that you do? Um, I don't think you would react very well, so why do it digitally? Would you have all your phone records, bank records, location records published publicly? Not the same as a PPI that's often talked about in, in uh, privacy terms, but we all have something to hide. We all have something we want to keep private. Vacuum cleaners are mapping out our living spaces and passing this on. Smart beds are recording and analyzing sleep patterns remotely. Children's toys have been co-opted. And worse than that, 
not only are they recording and passing on your child's conversations with the toy, but they're also asking personal questions, or they will. I think some of these toys have been banned in certain areas. And questions about where they live, details of other family members. This can't be right. And strange conditions are put into T's and C's that accompany these, these devices. No upgrades may not work as expected unless we can take your data. I'm not sure of the validity of, of, some, of the, some of these things. It doesn't seem to, to make sense to me. So once our privacy is violated, once our data is expropriated, do we have any say? Are we then being manipulated by increasingly accurate AI that nudges us towards a herd behavior? Is that the kind of society we want? Some of this has tried to be reflected in, in some of the uh, uh, frameworks that are being published around the world. And my colleague, Raymond, will uh, now take this up with you. Cool. Thank you, Jeremy, for this excellent introduction to the AI governance framework. For my part of the talk, I will focus on the big picture trends of AI governance proposed by governments, nonprofits, and countries all over the world to mitigate the negative impacts on people and society. We use the paper, The Global Landscape of AI Ethics Guidelines, that was published uh, in July 2019 uh, and contains 84 published uh, AI governance frameworks. These fr frameworks cover the following broad themes transparency, justice and fairness, non maleficence, responsibility, privacy, freedom and autonomy, trust, benevolence, benevolence sustainability dignity, solidarity. I will cover only the first seven in this talk as the last four are less common. For each of the principles listed, I provide an example where the principle has either a positive or a negative outcome. Spoiler alert, they are mostly negative. Framework development has mostly occurred in Europe and North America, but a small number of frameworks have been developed in Asia, including Singapore. Since the paper has been accepted, Two more important frameworks has also, have also emerged from China. The first theme I'm going to cover is transparency. Uh, this is also uh, part of explainability, interpret interpretability, and disclosure. This generally boils down to using machine learning or statistical models that can explain the reason behind the decisions that were made. A positive example of this are credit scores in the US that are used to determine eligibility for loans and credit cards. Everyone has a right to receive a credit report that explains all the information that goes into the score, like previous mortgage, utility payments, total debt, uh, and other things like that. This transparency reduces the likelihood of miscommunication and gives customers an idea on how to improve their scores. The next theme is justice and fairness. It also covers inclus inclusion, diversity, and accessibility. This is going to be a negative example. Some years back, a large e-commerce company built a tool to automate recruiting decisions. Give the system 100 resumes, and it would give you the top five candidates. Unfortunately, the algorithm was very biased against women. It turned out that the root cause of this was that men was over were overrepresented among hires in the historical data set that was used to train the model. Fortunately, the system was decommissioned after a year once the issue was realized. As Jeremy mentioned previously, this would be really bad for your company if you did this. The next uh, theme is non-maleficence, which covers safety, prevention, and security. Like the Hippocratic Oath taken by medical doctors, it is the principle of first do no harm. Just this year, dozens of women in Singapore had their images stolen from social media sites and doctored using the Deep Nude app. The app allows the user to replace porn star faces in pornographic images with faces of targeted women. Such doctored images were subsequently uploaded to sex forums. Note that creating, forwarding, or possessing these kinds of images is a form of sexual harassment and is covered in the recently passed Protection from Harassment Act. Following the outcry, the app was removed from the app store, but the harm to these women has already been done. The theme of responsibility also covers accountability, liability, and acting with integrity. In 2019, 650K Rohingya had to flee Myanmar for Bangladesh falling prosecution. 
a lot of that violence was fueled by hate speech spread on social media. In Myanmar, social media is in fact synonymous with the internet due to the high penetration rate. What level of responsibility does the social media platform bear for hate speech propagated through its content recommendation system? In many legal jurisdictions, the answer is quite a bit. Especially in the last couple of years, when several countries pass anti-fake news uh, laws. To their credit, the social media platform in question has significantly increased the number of Burmese-speaking content moderators to deal with such issues, but still, this may not be enough, especially considering our current COVID-19 pandemic situation and all the fake news and cures being passed around on the internet. Privacy is also an important part of AI governance, as well as data governance. Once again, in 2019, we saw the year that news broke about Cambridge Analytica harvesting data from millions of users to feed their political ad campaigns. This was very much against the terms and conditions of service for the social media platform when they took their data from. Not only did this spark a political firestorm, but Cambridge Analytica, Analytica was eventually shuttered in a hail of controversy for abusing the use of this personal data. Finally, we cover freedom and autonomy, which includes things like consent, self-determination, and empowerment. Make sure your customers know what they are getting into and have the freedom to decide what's in their best interest. A positive example would be making your terms of service easily understandable. The picture contains the terms of service of a number of very well-known online platforms. As you can see, they are mind-numbingly long. Don't do this. Ask for consent as and when you need to, instead of getting it upfront for everything possible. As generally mentioned previously, don't let organizations push you around to maximize profits. In summary, whichever part of the world you are in, there are frameworks coming into force. Many of them will become laws and regulations in the near uh, term. The faster we start considering them in our AI architectures, the more likely that we don't run afoul when they eventually become the law of the land. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it over back to Jeremy to close out. So. Okay, thank you very much, Rain, and some really good stuff in there. Um, hopefully it's giving people a lot to think about. Um, and I think the people here um, can help. This can be a little bit of a, of a call to action. Free open source software um, is a responsible movement out of which I think will come protections and ways of working to help mitigate bias, prejudice, and wrong outcomes. As individuals, you can question if the outcomes and motivations in applying AI align with the values of the, of the organization. Does the organization have any values? Building monitors and checks at regular interviews in the pipeline, including over time, maybe instrument certain areas so that outcomes are within expected boundaries. Um, I know that's not always possible in deep neural nets and things like that. But building alerts when you're finding outliers so that an investigation can be done. Perhaps these investigations can be done with external and internal ethical review boards involving legal and social scholars and other areas, not just the, te the technical people. Maybe we can set up citizen juries where AI, uh, where AI is going to be implemented by public bodies um, to gauge the temperature of people upon which these manipulations will be happening. Do your work well, do what you do best, and do your work responsibly. Be brave and be counted. Thank you very much. So we are from DataKind. We love data, but we need to be careful with it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye.